um, this is part in series of uh, certain topics that certain important topics in uh, medicine um, that are primarily derived from Harrison's. So first section, what we want to do, I'll jump right in, is cardinal manifestations. Uh, because today is the first session, I want to keep it short and sweet. So we have only 12 to 13 slides. So uh, at the end of this entire session, what I want you to remember is primarily the UGs and certain PGs that uh, the topic fever and febrile response, uh, you might not remember everything, whatever is going to be discussed. But what I want you to know is there is a lot more uh, that is there about fever and febrile responses than what one might think. So uh, once you go back and read from different textbooks or different books, uh, you need to know that there are certain difficult nuances that needs to be uh, given importance to. So uh, fever, the word fever comes from the Latin word febris. So why do we need to uh, delve into Roman mythology? We already know that we have uh, certain asuras okay, by the name Jwarasura. That's the name where Jwara comes from. So he was actually a uh, Asura who uh, basically was a dead. Um, he was actually uh, an Asura who tried to cause smallpox. So a lord uh, like uh, Shakti who took the form of uh, Sheetala, who is known to be a very big important uh, figure in Bengali literature, comes to reduce this fever. So the word fever or Jwara is basically a most ancient manifestation of one pathology and reduction in fever is its be best outcome, best beneficial outcome. So what is fever? So fever actually is very important. You have to remember the definition of fever. It's a regulated rise. Okay, it's a regulated rise. The word regulated is very important because uh, 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 drastic increases in fever can cause destruction in internal organ mechanisms that is called as hyperpyrexia or hyperthermia. So this regulated rise in the core body temperature uh, is called fever. So there are a lot more important keywords that needs to be told. It is the core body temperature and not just the body temperature. And there are certain diurnal variations which are normal in our body. So evenings you will have more a little more temperature than the morning. So above these daily fluctuations, a regulated rise in core body temperature is called as fever. But is that enough? So we already know that there are a lot of terms existing called as hyperthermia, hyperpyrexia, fever, etc., which is confusing everybody. The point of this discussion about the pathophysiology of fever is to obviate that confusion. So fever is a regulated rise in the core body temperature that occurs in conjunction in parallel to the hypothalamic set point rise. So if the hypothalamus, which is a temperature controlling area, if its temperature is not locally increased, similar to the body temperatures increase, then we don't call it fever. We'll call it pathologically increased temperature called hyperthermia or hyperpyrexia. We'll come to it later. So a regulated rise, core body temperature above the normal daily fluctuations, okay, and in conjunction with the hypothalamic regulatory set point. Hypothalamus is the seat and the nucleus in hypothalamus is the preoptic area. That is what I want you to remember from this slide. So the preoptic area in hypothalamus will raise its set point first. So the primary problem, primary inciting pathophysiology is the regulated rise in the hypothalamic set point. Once the hypothalamus set point increases from 27 to 30 degrees, let us say, the external part of the body, the periphery, everything works to increase itself to meet that hypothalamic set point. Once it meets the hypothalamic set point, that ends fever. Fever is established and you're already sweating and shivering, whatever it might be, whether you are in a decreasing trend of fever or increasing trend of fever. Generally, this 22nd edition of Harrison's is quoting 37.7 degrees as the cutoff for adults above which is called as fever. Now, because of the diurnal variation, we have two temperatures. One is 37.2 and 37.7. A morning AM temperature of 37.2 and a PM temperature of 37.7, above that is called as fever. Okay. As I told you, preoptic nucleus is the main nucleus that is concerned with generation of uh, fever, okay. generation of the increased core body temperature. I want you to in introduce you to this uh, uh, one more area called as OVLT. This OVLT is called as lamina terminalis. Okay organ vasculum. That means it's an organ vasculosum of lamina terminalis. 
Lamina terminalis is near the hypothalamus, anterior end. So the organ that is devoid of the blood-brain barrier that is so highly vascular because it is next to the bloodstream, body's uh, entire bloodstream itself. Because it is devoid of blood-brain barrier, all the cytokines that are produced in pathology reaches it directly. So it is like in the it's it's the face value of hypothalamus. Once OVLT is actually stimulated by cytokines, it can give rise to next pathways that stimulates the preoptic nucleus. And the main cytokine that actually causes this entire problem is IL-1 beta. So, but please remember, IL-1 beta is not the causation of fever. It is the cytokine that triggers the production of prostaglandins. So, if anyone asks what is the cause of fever, the substance is an autocoid. It is prostaglandin E2. And the cytokine that stimulates this entire process is IL-1 beta. So, you should know the difference between IL-1 and prostaglandin E2. These two are very important. They are very different. IL-1 is produced from the periphery, wherever the organism has come in from. Suppose I have a wound in the uh, elbow. So, from that breach, the endothelium is breached. Once endothelium is breached, there is tissue injury. IL-1 is produced by the endothelium or the tissues. That IL-1 reaches my hypothalamus. There, near the hypothalamus, the area that is devoid of blood-brain barrier is or OVLT. So, IL-1 stimulates OVLT and OVLT will stimulate preoptic area. So, that is what I want you to remember from this entire slide. Infection is not the only cause of fever. So, all the budding doctors or UGs, please understand the role of non-infectious uh, diseases or non-infectious pathologies that causes fever. Most Two most important is malignancy and autoimmune conditions. So, autoimmune conditions are non-infectious inflammatory disorders. Hereby, they will be called as NIID in Harrison's. So, NIID is non-infectious inflammatory disorders, malignancy. These are the topmost causes of non-infectious causes of fever. They can be drug fever. You can have autoimmune causes such as uh, hyperthyroidism uh, uh, and you can have intrinsic hypothalamic dysfunction as usual. But the most common cause is infection. The most common cause of non-infectious fever is malignancy and autoimmune conditions. Moving to the next one. This is what I told you. So, re recapitulating this, look, there is a pathogen that enters the body. We are just revising it. So, you can be attentive again here if you have not understood. So, pathogen enters the body. It stimulates endothelium and stimulates the innate immunity. Okay, monocytes. This releases IL-1. IL-1 is a cytokine that reaches the OVLT. Okay, OVLT is reached. Now, because it is devoid of blood brain barrier, it directly reaches the endothelium of the hypothalamus, wherein PGE2 is released. So, PGE2, please don't assume, here's the catch point, don't assume that PGE2 is entirely circulated into the whole body and that causes the vasodilatation or vasoconstriction. No, PGE2 is locally accumulated in and around the preoptic area in the hypothalamus and that local PGE2 rise causes fever. Okay, so how does that cause fever? Now, this PGE2, once it increases near the hypothalamus, it will stimulate some glial cells, microglial cells. These microglial cells will stimulate your pilomotor, vasomotor, pseudomotor regions in the uh, preoptic area, which then tell the entire body that you have to do so many different changes so that to increase the core body temperature. So, this is the entirety of uh, the pathophysiology of fever. So, IL-1 is released from the damaged endothelium, reaches OVLT. IL OVLT stimulates the endothelium. The endothelium releases local PGE2. It is not systemic PGE2. And some systemic PGE2, whatever it goes, a little amount, will cause your non-specific symptoms like malaise, fever, uh, malaise, arthralgia, etc., which is not fever per se, but they accompany fever. Okay, So, malaise uh, and arthralgia is caused by the little amount of peripheral PGE2 that is produced. This microglial cells are the ones that are get stimulated by the local PGE2 and that causes uh, neurons to be activated like vasomotor, pseudomotor areas. Now, the entire periphery will become vasoconstricted. So, you will get cool. You will become completely cold in the periphery. So, all the blood flow goes to the internal uh, organs and that increases the core body temperature. So, this is the pathophysiology of fever. If you go back to Harrison's with this analogy, if you go to read any table for that matter, you will be able to find a lot of uh, clarity in understanding what causes fever. It is not IL-1 that stimulates the microglia or anything like that. Okay. Now, let us say there are some conditions in which the blood-brain barrier is only breached or the condition is so severe 
that there's so much trauma and so much of sepsis or whatever, so much of infection, or the organism is actually extremely virulent, that IL-1 production is extremely high and extremely rapid. So here's the catch point. If IL-1 is extremely high or extremely rapid, it is able to penetrate through the weak, weak blood-brain barrier. It is so high in amount that it itself directly goes and stimulates the glial cells without involvement of PGE2. Now, if every whoever is actually in tune with me, we know that fever, we give paracetamol. Okay. So paracetamol is what? For those who have studied pharmacology, paracetamol is actually a cyclocox inhibitor. So it is going to inhibit prostaglandin release. If prostaglandins are there in the pathophysiology of normal fever, then it will help. So paracetamol will inhibit prostaglandins and hence fever will come down. But in certain conditions like severe sepsis, severe trauma, where IL-1 production is very high, it itself goes and directly produce, stimulates the glial cells for the fever production. PGE2 is not even there in the picture. So that way, your paracetamol or any analgesics won't work. This is called as hyperpyrexia. So hyperpyrexia is where there is extreme rise in body temperature and lot of severe uh, uh, IL-1 release where prostaglandins are not in that much of uh, action and where antipyretics are not in use. And the cutoff temperature is 41.5. So above 41.5, we call it hyperpyrexia. So in the slide, this is what we've written. You have pyrogens, which are endogenous, I told you, like IL-1. And then you have exogenous, like for example, microbes. Microbes will have LPS, lipopolysaccharides, which itself acts as a uh, cytokine, which itself basically stimulates the hypothalamus. That all this finally leads to release of autocoids, which is PGE2 from the hypothalamic endothelium and its local PGE2. Sometimes when the fever is very high and when the entire problem subsides, you get cryogens, which are opposite. Okay, They decrease the fever, uh, temperature. For example, alpha MSH and ADH. These are cryogens. These are most important cryogens. This is the Harrison table. If anyone reads this table without understanding the depth of uh, pathophysiology, they will mess it up. So basically, first thing that happens is the monocytes endothelium that gets destroyed and activated. They release IL-1. You need to pick up IL-1 here. Okay. They enter the circulation. They stimulate the hypothalamic endothelium. That hypothalamic endothelium releases PGE2. That increases CAMP, acts, acts in the glial cell, and then elevates the set point. So hypothalamic set point first goes up and once it is gone up, the periphery is stored to increase its own body temperature so that it meets the set point. So in conjunction with the hypothalamic set point, if the core body temperature increases, this is called as fever. Okay. Next one. This is what I've told basically summary. You have IL-1 here. Okay. IL-1 acts on the hypothalamic endothelial cell that releases uh, from arachidonic acid, it releases prostaglandins that acts on the EP3 receptor and increases the camp in the thermosensitive neurons of the glial cells. So this is what happens at the hypothalamic end. Okay, it's the glial cells finally that activates the vasomotor and pseudomotor regions. Okay. Now, if there is a bacteria, please look at this. If there's a bacteria, it has LPS, lipopolysaccharides, which directly stimulates liver Kupfer cells. This would definitely never occur to anybody unless they know it prior. So a bacteria which is entering, uh, entering systemically first activates the Kupfer cells in the liver, which then actually releases PGE2. Okay. That then directly goes to the hypothalamus. So this, this pathophysiology is not the classic one. It is the one that involves Kupfer cells of liver because of exogenous um, um, pyrogens like LPS. Okay. So please know that in the pathophysiology of fever, copper cells of liver also are involved. Okay. So uh, till now we've understood the concept of fever. We've understood what is, uh, what happens when IL-2, IL-1 is increased significantly high. When prostaglandins don't come into the play, they directly go and stimulate the hypothalamic areas, even if blood brain barrier is present or if it is not present. That type of uh, uh, febrile response is called as hyperpyrexia. So hyper fever is basically core body temperature rises because of the thermostat. So thermostat increases. That's why the core body temperature also increases. That is normal fever. And here PG is involved, right? Prostaglandins are involved. And that's why you can treat it with paracetamol. Correct. Now, 
if suppose in hyperpyrexia what happens is the core body temperature rises so high because the thermostat is not in control here the il1 is so significantly produced that prostaglandins have no control regulatory set point is not acting very uh, delicately so it is causing a lot of fever from which we cannot actually uh, use antipyretics okay and the cutoff please remember is 41.5 this is the highest spectrum of fever that's all okay here also it is the hypothalamus that uh, that causes the, uh, the, the set point to be raised up okay and most of the causes classical causes of hyperpyrexia are cns problems if you look at this the heat stroke and cns hemorrhage heat stroke and cns hemorrhage are the cns causes for hyperpyrexia okay then you have hyperthermia so in hyperthermia the concept is completely different in these two in fever and hyperpyrexia we saw that it was the hypothalamic set point that ca caused the periphery to increase its action so first thing that happened was the hypothalamic set point increasing but but here's the catch in hyperthermia it is the periphery the external factors that actually have already increased the core body temperature through some, its own mechanism now core body temperature is already increased without hypothalamus knowing it okay so hypothalamus has no control it is totally disconnected with the external body temperature externally if he is getting if he is put in a very high temperature room or external body temp, uh, external factors have caused it uh, caused the core body temperature to already have been increased the muscles are overactive completely or there is complete dissociation in the oxidative phosphorylation what happens is the hypothalamus is not no longer able to sense nor uh, adjust or monitor the core body temperature so there is some kind of thermoregulatory failure here also but it is not the inciting factor is the periphery it is the muscles and it is the uh, nerves and blood vessels in the periphery that have already increased the core body temperature okay so this excess heat production is one of the most important cause second important cause is failure to lose the heat failure to lose the heat for example hypothyroidism myxedema coma all those causes or certain anticholinergics all of these causes are hyper hyper cause for hyperthermia like these causes if you look at them they are neurolep malignant syndrome malignant hyperthermia serotonin syndrome all these actions are in the periphery in the neuromuscular junction so hence hypothalamus has no relation to hyper hyperthermia so fever hyperpyrexia and hyperthermia this differences have to be made clear fever is hypothalamic set point ray is uh, 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 raised then after that the periphery is told to increase its uh, uh, body temperature so that uh, the the set points meet in hyperpyrexia there is an overshoot and hypothalamus is no longer able to control it's failed in hyperthermia the periphery has increased its core its temperature so core body temperature has increased but hypothalamus is not able to sense it or act on it this is called as hyperthermia if this is understood we can move to certain facts okay so what is fraudulent fever what is factitious fever what is exercise that hyperthermia all these are very easy to be understood actually fraudulent fever is somebody who manipulates the thermometer okay he manipulates he goes and puts the thermometer inside uh, on a flame and then shows the temperature is more that is fraudulent fever okay now here the temp the pulse rate will be normal it wouldn't have increased the the best thing to do is monitor the patient while he is actually monitoring his own temperature or test the, te the temperature in different sites that is one thing what is factitious fever so factitious fever is when fever is present the body temperature has increased okay truly increased but he has injected certain contaminated substances so that the temperature increases that is called as fraudulent uh, factitious fever so the key importance a key difference is in fraudulent fever he, the temp thermometer is actually manipulated whereas in factitious fever there is true rise in core body temperature but that is due to something else being injected by the patient himself okay both of this are a part of malingering and uh, factitious disorders so the key difference has to be known okay please don't get confused in that exercise induced hyperthermia is an important term that's been added in the 22nd set, uh, uh, edition in which usually you know fever inflammatory causes CR, crp and esr is always increasing okay some amount is in, expected even in non inflammatory cause of fever also crp and esr increases but in exercise induced hyperthermia post the exercise is ended there is an elevation of body temperature okay and that is not at all associated with increase in crp and esr they are normal that is called as exercise induced hyperthermia just a fact for you to know but there is no clinical nobody has ever seen this kind of patients anywhere in current clinical practice
let's come to the whole different section on pyrexia of unknown origin okay if so we've understood what is fever and usually clinically when someone comes to you like i'll put a clinical aspect when someone comes to you who has been referred to you and uh, all normal cause of fever have, has been ruled out okay now he is almost about 21 days or 3 weeks he has been evaluated he has been suffering with fever daily and there's a documented rise in temperature also he is not having any known uh, immunosuppressed state there's no hiv tb aids or any sense of uh, severe uncontrolled diabetes nothing so any patient who has been roaming around for more than 3 weeks with fever who is not having any immunocompromised uh, situation as of now and his fever is more than 38.3 centigrade at least on two occasions okay so and all most of the basic obligatory tests have been done so what is this obligatory test these are important words that should not be actually taken um uh, you know um for granted obligatory tests mean something very specific okay so um by definition, pyrexia of unknown origin is any patient above three weeks with temperature more than 38.3 uh, taken over two different locations and no prevailing immunocompromised state. Okay. And all obligatory tests have been done. Now, if anyone who listens to me with a lot of intent, ANA or anti nuclear antibody test is also considered as an obligatory test while you are evaluating a patient with FUO. You might think only blood culture, X-ray and all that CBC, RFT, whatever, everything, everything that comes to your mind as a general practitioner is also an obligatory test, but even ANA is an obligatory test. Okay. Although ANA should not be done without a particular proper indication, you need to know that ANA is also a part of an obligatory test. So all this have been done and they've been unremarkable. So this patient is now called as an FUO. FUO is the most underrated uh, uh, algorithm that in Harrison's that is not keenly touched upon. Okay, So in India, obviously, TB becomes the most important cause. In the West, NIID, I've already told you in the previous slides, NIID means non-infectious inflammatory disorders. That is the most important common cause. Rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, all those come as common cause of FUOs. Okay, Now, I'll come to the other ones later. Look at these causes. Can anybody actually name more than 10 they will be able to name 50 to 100 cause of fuo basically anything and everything on the list of uh, infections can cause uh, fuo but then why are they causes if they're already known that means they are already they're causing but they have not been able to detect it that's all its detection rate has been so uh, dormant i mean it's uh, its activity is so dormant that it, that the detection rate is very low so look at all these causes systemic rheumatic autoimmune diseases i've obviously put only causes that are non-infectious because anything you can name any infection and you can put it and that becomes a cause for fuo tb brucellosis sarcoidosis everything comes as a cause so vasculitis granulomatous diseases autoinflammatory syndrome and very specific some name syndromes actually that uh, you know catch your eye caps cryopyrin associated periodic syndrome and uh, dira okay deficiency of uh, il1 receptor antagonist Okay, and uh, PAPS syndrome, TRAPS, Schindler, and uh, AOSD, very important AOSD. All these are cause of autoimmune, autoinflammatory syndrome. You need to see it once or thrice and keep revising. That's all. There is no other way to know this unless you actually come across a patient who's having these issues or you're in a pediatric ward and working up a patient of FUO. Okay, malignancy is also caused. Classically, please remember all your Hodgkin's disease. Okay. All your lympho uh, lymphoid uh, malignancies are most important. Solid tumors, mo most common is RCC. Okay, RCCs, please remember. And METs, METs from any organs actually causes uh, FUO. Okay, I won't stress about it too much. Um, now, how do you manage a PUO? See, look, now I won't tell any general points from here henceforth. I won't tell you that please give PCM, please uh, uh, do blood cultures again, uh, do a better blood culture, take the sample properly. These are general dictums that everybody know. What do we know that is, uh, what should we know that is missed from Harrison's or missed from your general uh, bird's eye view? Look, this is the gen, uh, this is the table from Harrison's which shows obligatory in, uh, investigations. These obligatory in investigations include ANA, they include rheumatoid factor, they include uh, USG. Why not CT? CT is not here. So why not CT? CT is considered to be inferior to USG. This is a catch, catch point. Harrison's clearly tells, and the current review of fever also currently tells, that abdominal CT confers no new uh, advantage over USG. In fact, USG is fast. It doesn't require a lot of uh, um, uh, 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 skill compared to CT. And USG is a time saving. Okay, And radiation exposure is definitely less. So CT is not there here. It's only USG. That is what you have to remember from this. 
There are three parts to managing a FUO. First stage diagnostics, which everybody would have already done. That is the obligatory investigations. So later stage diagnostics is what we have to remember and understand in this lecture. And a second opinion from an expert center. This is totally important, which we will not do primarily because the concerned physician is too proud of himself to actually refer a patient. If you don't know anything, if you're not in the uh, field of expertise, please don't fear, please don't feel shameful in referring a patient or asking for a second opinion. Second opinion from expert center has a very high rate of success. Okay, I'll come to it. Now, in FUO, if you look at the data on FUO or if you look at uh, uh, literature on FUO, you get something called as PDCs. What are PDCs? Potentially diagnostic clues. These are potential diagnostic clues. There are clues or information from history, symptoms, signs, anything for that matter that can help the physician to think, okay, this could pause, this fever is probably coming from liver issue or this fever is probably coming from a, a lung issue or an autoimmune issue or a mal malignancy issue. It's potentially driving us towards that particular area. So if those PDCs are present, then it's very good. We can go and do a targeted uh, diagnostic uh, tests, but if they're not present is the catch. So what if anybody actually can answer this to me, what is the next step when PDCs are absent? When you don't have any clues, what is the next step in the evaluation of fever? Can anyone tell? So uh, basically, I won't let anybody answer because I know nobody will. So it's cryoglobulins. Okay. So cryoglobulins is basically the next step. Very surprising, right? It's not at all in the diagnostic algorithm in anyone's mind. But if you look at the uh, Harrison's uh, algorithm, if you come from the top, can revise from the bot, uh, top, these are the criteria, Peter Dobson Beeson's criteria. Uh, you do a fever of more than 38.3 uh, uh, and three weeks of illness and no known immunocompromised state. You do a history and physical examination. You stop all the antibiotics and steroids. First thing you do, a practical point for any person who wants to practice, stop all the antibiotics, stop all steroids, stop all types of steroids, all modes of steroids and any paracetamol that the patient is taking. Okay, that's very, very important. You instruct the patient also. After you stop, then you go on evaluating, try to analyze the type of fever, the analysis of fever. Once you've done that, you do your first stage investigation, which is obligatory investigations. Like I told you, stress upon all the important things like protein electrophoresis is also considered to be an obligatory investigation. Okay, so once the first stage investigations are done, you do second stage, later stage. Okay, so what is the later stage? You exclude manipulation with thermometer, like we told, fraudulent fever. You exclude the, the, uh, the manipulation with the thermometer. Once you do that, you see if there are any PDCs. You repeat your history again, you dissect it more, you ask for more signs and symptoms. If PDCs are present, then guided diagnostic tests. So if, if you have a eye and headache, you then do you do a fundus examination like that. So if PDCs are absent, then we have uh, at a problematic end. So if PDCs are absent or they're misleading, the first thing you do is a cryoglobulin. Cryoglobulin is conventionally told by Western literature to be of less uh, cost and easier to do, but that's not the case. Cryoglobulins and fundoscopy is done. If they are also unremarkable, if you don't get any positive finding there also, the next thing you do is directly jump to a PET CT. Please remember, any slide that I'm putting with an orange background is clinically important and the core of this entire idea. So PET CT, well, it's not just PET, it is not just CT, it is PET CT. So next step is PET CT. First was cryoglobulins and fundus, okay? Once you finish cryoglobulins, nothing found, PET CT you do. PET CT is very good actually, okay? Some people say PET CT, okay, hyperglycemia is there, you might get pick up a lot of metabolic events that are not necessary. That is true, but once you've taken a good nuclear medicine consult, a PET CT is extremely important in uh, diagnosis of uh, FUO. You do an, a PET CT. Once you do a PET CT, if you're not having a PET CT, you can do a scintigraphy, okay? You do a scintigraphy using gallium or technetium, okay? These two scintigraphies come second. They're not the first line. If PET CT is not affordable or not there, then you do scintigraphy. So once you've done that, there also, if you don't get any findings, okay, let us say that you couldn't find using PET CT also. The third step you move to is a temporal artery biopsy. Look how specific these things are. They're not actually very uh, easily guessable, okay? Temporal artery biopsy. There's a third thing. And then you do a CT of any area that you're concerned, in, interested in. Now, why? Once you've already done a, a PET CT, why do you need a temporal artery biopsy if there are no uh, PDCs? That is the catch. Harrison's also mentions this. Giant cell arteritis, above the age of 55, the patient is especially 
it will not be picked up by fdg they are very small to medium to small arteries they will not be picked up by any uh, lesions they are not that avid to be picked up by the uh, pet scan so if pet ct is also negative and PDCs are still absent, you directly go for a temporal artery biopsy in a patient who is more than 55 years old. And this becomes even more important if there are some kind of head and neck problems and vision problems also. If you still don't get a diagnostic uh, 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 you know, drive, if you still don't get any clues, then you go for uh, uh, new PDCs, follow up the patient if he is stable, or if he is deteriorating, you do a therapeutic trial. Sometimes you give a naprosin test. A naprosin test is basically you give naproxen which works in good in inflammatory conditions. So 250 mg BD or 500 mg BD of naproxen sometimes subsides an inflammatory fever. Okay, So that time you can give a therapeutic trial or you can do further more tests or you can give a blanket uh, investigation trial practically to find out what is going wrong with the patient. So in the order of importance, uh, algorithm of PUO has to be revised properly. So let's uh, do this again. So first you diagnose using the, the uh, PTDOFS criteria. You do the obligatory investigations, which becomes the first st stage investigations. Then you exclude the manipulation with thermometer. Then you see for later stage investigations. Later stage investigations are guided by PDCs or potential diagnostic clues. If PDCs are present, then good. You do that particular area, that particular etiologies work up. If PDCs are absent, then your first thing you do is cryoglobulins and fundus. Second, you do is a PET CT. Third, you do is a temporal artery biopsy if more than 55. And fourth, you do a therapeutic trial or a blanket investigation for everything. So this is how you go on with the algorithm of FUO. So FUO algorithm is very specific and very uh, underrated. Okay. So here, if you look, once you're done with later stage diagnostics, what we saw, we saw second opinion in an expert center. Correct. See here, expert center. So we don't know what an expert center is. So the next referral center from your hospital. Look at this number. Anyone interested in numbers will actually know how important this value is. A single study tells that 57.3% of the patient, that means if every almost half the patient that you get who are FUOs, if you are not able to do anything about it, if you refer or get a fresh perspective, they actually can find something in half the cases. That's a huge amount. Okay. So it's better to collaborate while taking a uh, uh, while managing a patient of FU to miss the chances of, uh, you know, uh, uh, mistreatment or misdiagnosis. Okay. So this is the important slide that is telling you about uh, the algorithm of FU. Let's take a question. Okay. If all of you are a little dull or like too much uh, um, pressured, here is a 72 year old female. Okay. She is having fever for more than three weeks. Correct. Four weeks she's having. There are no PDCs. There are no potential diagnostic clue. Once there is no potential diagnostic clue, you go to cryoglobulins and fundus. So cryoglobulin fundus also is normal, unremarkable. What is the next thing you do? PET CT. So PET CT was done. Look at the PET CT. So was it useful here? Should we have done PET CT here? Let us assume that she was not diabetic or there's no other uh, causes that uh, there are no other contraindications to PET CT. So if you look at PET CT, there's, up, there's activity, there is increased uptake in the subclavian. Okay. This is very important, right? So this is pointing towards a vasculitic, large to medium vessel vasculitis. So this can never be picked up otherwise. Even if signs symptoms are very nonspecific, she might not have any claudication. She might not have any decreased uh, perfusion uh, symptoms. So this is very important when you don't have any clue, PET CT actually picks up a lot of events. In temporal artery biopsy, why we do temporal artery biopsy post a normal PET CT also is because these arteries are too large. Okay, They can be easily picked up. But if you go here, these arteries are too small. You can never see them. That's why you go and do temporal artery biopsy because the yield is that high. The positive predictive value of temporal artery biopsy is very high. Okay. So that's why we do a temporal artery biopsy. Now, there are some interesting statements that I would want to, you know, and conclude the statement we already discussed. So giant cell arteritis can be missed in a PET scan also. So always go for a biopsy in a patient who's having persistent fever. Now, scintigraphy, I told you, is second line. First line is always PET CT. If it's not there, you do a gallium or a technetium uh, leukocyte scintigraphy. Okay. And they have to be done only during the febrile episodes and not otherwise. The yield is high when you do them during a febrile episode. And any patients whose fever is lasting for more than two years, okay, an infection or a malignancy can be ruled out. Any dangerous infection uh, or malignancy can be ruled out because they usually progress fast and the symptoms and signs tend to compound and come out very easily within two years, especially. I've already told you, USG was never uh, was more important, superior to abdominal CT in the workup of FUO in the first line investigations, not the second line. As a part of obligatory investigations, USG is better than CT. 
performing more than three blood cultures or having more than proper one urine culture is actually not that useful. You can just stop it at three or one proper urine and blood culture. Okay. Now look at these statements. The last two statements, if anybody is actually listening to this properly, uh, whoever, uh, which of this is true and which of this is false. See, if you find a patient having issues with your CBC report, okay, you have pancytopenia, bicytopenia, some kind of cytopenia, some peripheral smear, some kind of dysmorph dysmorphism is present. That is a PDC. That is a potential diagnostic clue. So that becomes a PDC for bone marrow biopsy directly. So the bone marrow biopsy yield is very high in a patient who's having cytopenias and CBC issues. Okay. Whereas if you look at the statement, this is false. I will directly tell you. Okay, please. Now here, if you look at this, any PDCs for uh, liver biopsy to be very careful. So any random transaminitis without any jaundice, uh, any uh, mild hyperbilirubinemia or mild cholestatic picture, ALP rise, all these are not PDCs for liver biopsy. You need to have a conclusive uh, evidence of a liver problem for doing a liver biopsy. That is because liver biopsy by itself is very invasive and does not yield that much in the absence of strong uh, PDCs. The patient should have had an history of autoimmune disorders for you to suspect autoimmune hepatitis, or you should have certain uh, 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 strong uh, uh, episodic nature of uh, jaundice for you to go ahead and do a liver biopsy. Younger the patient, the yield is better. Okay. So these are some interesting facts. Now, this is the last uh, slide that I want to tell. And this I don't want to emphasize much because this does not apply in our clinical practice at all. No matter how much you go through in UG or in PG, you will never be able to uh, discern a pattern of fever because patients would have already been treated uh, multiple times. The patient will be taking a lot of uh, 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 you know, antipyretics. And the goal of current treatment is to uh, you know, alleviate the pain and the fever. It's more towards a palliative nature. So you can't uh, expect to give fever to the patient just to make out the pattern of uh, fever. You can't. So types of fever is not an important concept with respect to current clinical practice. They might be important for exams. So that's why I'll tell you what they are. So continuous fever is any fever that is lasting more uh, always above the normal range, okay, and the fluctuations are less than one degree, okay. They're, but they're irrespective of what the fluctuations are, they never come to baseline, okay. That happens in sepsis, UTI, deep seated abscesses, pneumonia, etc. They're always above and they're always ongoing. Second is intermittent fever. All types of malaria come under this, so it can be quotidian, it can be tertian, it can be quadrant, it can be anything. So temperature it comes down, okay, it comes down to the baseline. And the daily fluctuations are less than one degrees. Okay. Daily fluctuations normally less than one degree. All types of malaria come under this. Okay. So quotidian fever, like I told you here, the uh, fever occurs every 24 hours. In tertian fever, fever occurs every 48 hours. Okay. And quotidian fever, fever occurs every 72 hours. 72 hours. Can any everybody see that there is no 36 hour here? There is no 36 hour periodicity. Please don't utter or mention 36 in your exams. Okay. Remittent fever is similar to intermittent. It comes down to the baseline, temperature reaches the baseline, but the daily fluctuations is more than one degree. That is classically seen in infective endocarditis. Remittent fever. Quotidian, I've already told you, is plasmodium nolesi, where the periodicity is 24 hours. Every 24 hours, there is fever. Okay. What is double quotidian? In double quotidian, the fever spikes happen twice in a day. Okay, in 24 hours span, you have fever twice. This is classically described in inflammatory arthritis. Inflammatory arthritis, ASOD, that is ad adult onset stills disease, uh, and visceral uh, visceral uh, leishmaniasis. Okay, leishmaniasis also is a classical example of double quotidian fever. But mind you, all these types of fever are no longer in clinical practice. You cannot discern them properly, uh, primarily because of antipyretic. Uh, um, treatment. Okay. So this is about fever. So what I want you to know at the end of fever is this topic requires a de detailed learning. You might not remember what I've told you, but please know that there's no more to this knowledge than th that uh, it has been told about. So uh, IL-1 is the cytokine that causes uh, the activation of the hypothalamus, but it is a local PGE2 that acts on the glial cell, increases the CAMP, that actually cause the neurons to fire, telling the entire body to increase its temperature to meet the hypothalamic set point. Okay. Hi fever, hyperpyrexia, hyperthermia are all distinct and all different and they have all different causes. They might be under the same spectrum and one can convert to another, but their definitions and their understandings are different. PO criteria we have seen 38.3, three weeks and no immunocompromised state and obligatory investigations including ANA, USG and electrophoresis have already been done. 
role of PDCs in PUO is very important. If you don't identify PDCs, repeat, take history again, dissect, ask, ask parents, travel history, sexual history, everything possible to find out a PDC. Because the moment you don't find a PDC, you land yourself in trouble and the patient has to you know, spend a lot and you go into an algorithm of FUO. In the nuances of management of FUO, you have four important steps if PDCs are absent. First is cryoglobulin and fundus. Second one, you go to PET CT. If PET CT is normal, you go for temporal artery biopsy. If temporal artery biopsy is not there, you do a blanket investigation and you uh, consider for a therapeutic trial. So these are the four important steps in a patient with FUO who's not having any PDCs. So 